something you would never just do. You probably wouldn't just do one single activity in isolation. In the lane and tech and early, is that published now? No, it's not. I looked for that as well. So that, that one isn't. This particular one is still, um, it's a corrective proof. It's EE published, but um, that, that would be another very interesting um, measure analysis to, to look into in a bit more detail. Thanks, Thank Carolyn. You. Thank you. That's yours there, Thomas. My favourite topic, Tom. Is it? Oh, good. It's my, my favourite. Friends about number nine. So. <laughs> 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 I know. So thank you. Thanks for the chance to uh, for me to do Journal Club. It does give me a little bit of an opportunity to indulge my interest in the microbiome and to uh, put that onto you. So I hope you find this interesting. I've, there's a bit of discussion around the microbiome initially and then a particular paper that we'll focus on uh, looking at some specific details. So the microbiome is fascinating. I mean, there's 10 times more bacteria living on us than there are us. So 10 times more cells than us. And if you look at the genetic material, there's a probably a hundred times more genes that are not us than are us. So we're really just a host for a huge number of other organisms, pathogens, and so forth. So one to 3% of our body weight is not us. Um, that's not our clothes and our shoes. That's uh, other microbiota that are, that are upon us. And I'm really talking about the bacterial component of the microbiome today, but there's also an interest in what's the viral component of our, of our microbiome also, and even less is known about that. I found this excellent slide that I really like. Uh, so there's, I like Google Images. Uh, there's between 10 and 100 trillion uh, microbial cells on us. Uh, some of those figures I've put there, but I think the two figures that I, I find most interesting are the two red circles down the bottom. If you look at between two people, our genetic material is 99.9% .9 similar from one person to another. But if you look at our microbiota, it's between 80 and 90% different from, uh, from person to person. Even if you look at monozygotic twins, the microbiota is about 50% different from uh, one twin to another. So there's a huge variability in uh, the organisms that are on us. What does that mean? That's the much more tricky part. There's all sorts of associations with differences in the microbiome, and I'll talk a little bit about how we look at the microbiome in a minute, but all sorts of fascinating associations. And really, if you put microbiome in, you know, there's nearly a paper on every, every possible condition in medicine. Obesity I find fascinating, particularly interesting work that if you take the microbiome from fat mice and put it into thin mice, they become fat. And if you take the microbiome from thin mice and put it into fat mice, uh, they become thin. Uh, there's some small evidence not randomised in the same way in humans that that uh, also can exist. And our gut microbiome is incredibly important for the fermentation of carbohydrates. So it probably relates somehow to to that. There's associations with the presence of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, a number of cancers, gastric, uh, gastric and colorectal, liver pathology in particular, most of the, circul the portal circulation, or most of the blood circulation to the liver comes straight from the gut, 
uh, allergy, celiac disease, you know, a list goes on there. And really, uh, that was a summary of the potential list. And if you look through the literature, you could put another 10 or 15 conditions on that list quite easily where there's associations. So something in the microbiome is associated with some clinical outcome. Directionality and causality is much less well identified. I think, however, there is some evidence around causality, and this is really the classic example of that. And we know that with recurrent C. difficile, uh, there's evidence for the use of faecal microbiota transplant. So getting a donor, taking their poo, putting it into the person who's got recurrent C. diff, and uh, you get good clinical outcomes. And this was a paper in New England from a few years ago, looking at people with recurrent C. diff, and the two tall bars are uh, those so they had an 81% recurrence with their first infusion of donor poo, and if you used a subsequent infusion, if the first one didn't work, you could get it up to 93%, compared to continuing on with your oral vancomycin, and you're getting you know, really very low cure rates there. So this trial was stopped early. There's been multiple other trials uh, looking at this. There's a lot of uncertainty around what's the best way to give this. Should you give it orally, nasogastrically, nasoduodenally, colorectally, uh, and how much should you give? Should you get the faeces from a bank of donors? Should you get it from a close relative? Should you get it from a young, healthy person? Who should you include? Who should you exclude? Uh, and I think where that will go is a preformed poo pill, and there's also recent studies on preformed poo pills that you take that have got good clinical outcomes in terms of treatment of C. diff, but also there's some treatment evidence in terms of inflammatory bowel disease and some other conditions as well, so improved outcomes. And I find it fascinating because really, you you know, we've talked earlier on how many kilos equivalent you have of microbiome in your gut, and the infusions are often only 50 grams or 100 grams. So by weight, a very small component, however, it has a major change in altering your microbiome. There's a lot of, we don't really know why's in that. So what's in the bowel? Uh, and there's two sort of main ways to look at it. And I'll flag first that the first, the paper that we're going to look today at is the culture method. So what we've traditionally done with the bowel is we've taken a stool sample, we've put it onto a range of plates and we've seen what grows. And then we've said that what grows equals what's significant, which is somewhat akin to going to a rainforest, taking a bucket of soil, taking it home, putting it in your garden and saying that whatever grows is therefore what's important in the rainforest. And we don't really know that that's the case. And we're also, there's strong evidence that a stool sample is not a perfect representation of what's in the guts. So the things that come through don't represent everything uh, that is there. The other way that we are now starting to really look at the microbiome is through whole genome sequencing and complex genetic testing to really look at all the organisms that are there and then identify all the genes that are present. And this has really only become possible in the last five to 10 years where whole genome sequencing has become relatively cheap and possible to do in, in large numbers. The real thing, however, with all of that is that we don't know what equals significance and that all the studies looking at that very much equate quantity with significance. And that's why other yellow picture there is, if you, do, if you did a genetic test on that picture there, your, the significant thing would be all that yellow grass and so forth, and the, the tree would be missed in terms of the quantity of genome present. I don't know what the significance of things are, but really our assumption using whole genome sequencing is that what is there in quantity equals what is significant. There's uh, something like five phyla and 160 species in most people, probably a lot more than that. The two most common phyla are firmicutes and Bacteroides, and as I said, there's a major role in carbohydrate fermentation, which is probably one of the roles that links to diabetes, inflammation, uh, obesity, and so forth. I saw this nice uh, thing in a paper just uh, in the last few weeks, describing antibiotics as a four-edged sword. There's a benefit to the individual, we know that. There's a benefit to the community by preventing the spread of disease to others. There's significant drivers of resistance, but then there's also collateral to the damage to the microbiota, which is really something that we're only just starting to understand. We understand that alterations to the microbiota are occurring, but what's damaged and what's beneficial and so forth is much less well understood. 
So that's a little pre prequel to uh, uh, to this paper. So this paper is looking at the impact of ciprofloxacin and clindamycin administration on gram-negative bacteria isolated from healthy volunteers and then characterising the resistance genes that they harbour. So their aim is to assess the impact of either cipro and clindamycin, and they also have a placebo group, on culturable gram-negative. So go back to those two ways that you can look at the stool. This is a paper looking at what can be cultured. That other stuff that wasn't cultured when you take the sample and put it on the plates really doesn't get included in this study uh, and the genes they harbour. And then they're particularly in interested to assess if antimicrobial resistance genes associated with aerobes can be present in anaerobes. And you can imagine why that's important because one of our sort of concerns is that by giving antibiotics we uh, alter, we knock off the E. coli, uh, for example, we, but all those anaerobes that are there in our gastrointestinal tract, are they able to collect the genes, if you like, from the aerobes into the anaerobes and then sit there as a harbour, as a reservoir of resistance genes that can then uh, transfer by, by plasmids and so forth back to uh, the, the organisms that we do in fact culture. So what did they do? They had healthy Swedish uh, volunteers, 30 of them, and they were in three groups. Uh, one group got 500 milligrams of Cipro for 10 days, BD. Another group got clindamycin, 150 milligrams, 10 uh, QID for 10 days. And the third group didn't had a placebo antibiotics. They'd all not had any antibiotics for three months before the study. Uh, and then they had saliva and fecal specimens collected. Specimens were collected at day zero, day 11, so I, that's the end of their 10-day course of antibiotics, and then at one month, two months, four months, and one year. So, and I think they only had one drop out of one person who moved overseas or some, uh, there was some other reason that they weren't able to continue, but quite good because we often don't see that long-term follow-through of, of really what happens. And we might say, well, things have been altered over a short period, but what, is, what does that mean over the long term? So they plated things out onto selective and non-selective media. And importantly, they also plated them out onto plates containing both clindamycin or ciprofloxacin. So essentially to look for people who'd been given ciprofloxacin and clindamycin and had subsequently developed pathogens that would, could, could grow having had ciprofloxacin or clindamycin. So to see if there was potential resistance there. If bacteria grew on the anti on the plates with the antibiotics in, so either the Cipro or the Clinder, they were screened for antimicrobial resistance genes by uh, a microarray. So that's when you have a cassette, I guess, with a whole range of uh, probes for a whole no range of known genes associated with resistance. Then you take a small sample of whatever's cultured, you blend it up, for want of a particular word, put it in with your probes and see what attaches to your probes and then you use a fluorescent probe or something to know how much is attaching to uh, those particular genes that you've identified. So you're not looking for any genes, you're only looking for the genes that are on your microarray plate. It's not a test, it's not a whole genome sequence where you have the whole genome, you've only got whatever's on your plate that you're, you're actually looking for. They also did on the cultures that grew on the clindamycin or cipro plates, a Molditoff, which is a, a rapid assessment of which bacteria is present, and then a Vitec, which is a testing modality to assess the sensitivity of those organisms. They did some pulse field gel, gel electrophoresis, pulse, pulse field gel electrophoresis on H18 isolates. I won't go into to that. So what did they find? So I'll go I'll go through these graphs individually. So the first one is E. coli. So uh, graph A there. And what you see is that there's no real change in the group given clindamycin, as we would expect. We know that clindamycin doesn't usually kill E. coli. There's no real change in the group from placebo, but the group given ciprofloxacin has a significant drop, as we would expect, uh, after they were given the ciprofloxacin. But then the E. coli comes back up over a period and by about two months is back to about the level that it was prior to, to giving the antibiotics. If we looked at going across the number B, leptotrichia, which is an oral anaerobe uh, on your teeth, generally speaking, uh, so you would expect that clindamycin would kill that. It 
the clindamycin group goes down after the course and then comes back up to, by about four months, be back up to the levels that it was before. Vianella, which is a, again, an anaerobe, but more of a gut anaerobe than a mouth anaerobe, uh, no real changes in uh, concentration in saliva. Interestingly, if you go across to D, what you see is that VLL, which is a, this particular anaerobe, has increased growth on ciprofloxacin plates after being given the ciprofloxacin. So some suggestion that this, that you select with the ciprofloxacin the VNL clones that are particularly able to grow in the presence of ciprofloxacin and uh, more of those grow uh, once you've given a course of ciprofloxacin. And then bacteroides, again, a, a gut anaerobe, which we would expect some action from clindamycin, drops down but returns back to about the normal levels by about two months uh, post. So what were the key findings? After Cipro, we saw a decrease in E. coli, as we would expect. After Clinda, a decrease in bacteroides in faeces and leptotrichia um, in saliva, and both returned to the pretreatment levels between one and four months after the administration of the course of antibiotics. Interestingly, after the ciprofloxacin, there was an increased VLLR, so select, suggesting a selection of VLLR clonal isolates that are able to be resistant to ciprofloxacin. So then from the isolates that grew on the either Cipro or Clinda plates, they uh, looked at uh, both initially aerobic species. So this is just aerobes for the moment. So if you look at uh, table S3, and really it was E. coli was far and away uh, the most common organism uh, that was grown there. And uh, just if you can see on that other, probably there's not a lot of additional information in uh, the, the table on the right as you look at it, but showing that in both the Cipro group, the Clindo group and the placebo group, they didn't really identify aerobes in the saliva, but they had aerobes and anaerobes in the faeces and anaerobes uh, in the saliva on the, on the culture plants. Antimicrobial ge resistance genes were detected in faecal aerobic isolates. So this is essentially within the E. coli. Interestingly, there wasn't an association in the presence of these antimicrobial resistance genes with the administration of antibiotics, suggesting that amongst healthy Swedish volunteers, and we you know, think of the Swedes as pretty good users of um, antibiotics, uh, there's a high rates of the presence of antimicrobial resistance genes, the most common being, I won't go through them uh, one by one, uh, but if you looked at the presence of at least one antimicrobial resistance gene, about two-thirds of isolates had the presence of at least one antimicrobial resistance gene, and some had the, the percentage of isolates of particular genes was uh, hitting for 40% um, in some cases. Now, if we look at the percentage of saliva and faecal anaerobes that were positive for antimicrobial resistance genes by microarray, uh, and so with, these are a different set of genes that they were looking for in anaerobes largely. Not to, uh, some of the ones were also looking for in the aerobes were in the anaerobes. There was, I've sort of highlighted a few things, but you do see increased rates of resistant genes in the anaerobes in both the Cipro and Clinda administration genes. That's on the TET down there on the sort of first red circle. And in the faeces also some increased uh, in some uh, B-lactamase resistance. Uh, genes there in the groups that were given Cipro and clindamycin. Interestingly, to address their question of can resistance genes that are in aerobes be identified in anaerobes, they only identified one gene, which is the Sol2. That's the one there uh, that I've put in green. And if uh, we go back, that was also on the previous list, I think. Second line. Second line. Uh, in uh, uh, in in the aerobes, so that was the only gene that was identified in the aerobes and also in the anaerobes. So there wasn't a high identification of resistance genes in the anaerobes uh, that were identified in the aerobes. So I guess whilst this is one paper that doesn't debunk that idea completely by by any stretch, it doesn't really support that sort of thinking in, I guess, I've had in my head that if we've got resistance genes present in what we can culture, does that necessarily mean that they're also just sort of hiding there in the things that we, we can't necessarily culture? Again, this is 
doesn't really address that question because the isolates that you've identified are initially done through culture. They're not done through whole genome sequencing. So you've only got that 1% or whatever it is you can culture. And you've said that within the aerobes and the anaerobes that you can culture, you don't have movement or association of, negative, of genes present in the aerobes and the anaerobes. But it still doesn't really address that question of what about all those other anaerobes that we're not able to, to culture here. So um, in conclusion, resistance genes are widespread, even in healthy Swedish volunteers. If you'd asked me you know, what would the presence of resistance genes, I would have said much less in that cohort. You know, who knows what healthy Indian volunteers would have. Uh, there was not a strong association uh, with the administration of antibiotics in this, uh, in this particular study. They didn't identify any plasmid-mediated quinolone resistance, which was something they were particularly looking for. Um, there was no strong evidence of anaerobes harboring resistance genes for aerobes. I did, I do like Google Images. I found this fantastic flashing slide from the Human Microbiome Project, which I just thought I would leave up there uh, as a, but it's, you know, you can just read the flashing red lights. It's got the species. I, did, I couldn't really fit it into the talk, but I just thought I should include it. Um, you can go back to that later if you like. Uh, and I think the whole microbiome really makes you think, well, We've had a mentality, probably as infectious diseases physicians, of really we go around with antibacterials and we kill antibiotics and we kill bacteria. But humans aren't sterile, and antibiotics don't make humans sterile. Uh, antibiotics affect selection pressure, and we don't really understand the impact of uh, of what that selection pressure is. And maybe over the course of our careers, we'll get a much greater understanding. But I think at the moment, it really heightens our thinking that we need to be cautious with the use of antibiotics because they do have this effect on selection pressure of, uh, of our microbiome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think that they excluded, they only had a three month product because the microbiome studies that I looked at there's actually appears to be an alteration in the biome that can last for a long time. Mm -hmm. So in pediatric studies, exposure to the macrolides, there was a change in biology composition for at least 12 months. And very early uh, macrolide resistance genes that took at least six months to go. So, and then there was a lot of stuff in Ethan about microbiomes. Mm -hmm. But for clinicians, we it's very important for us to look at the phenotypic impact of antibiotics, whereas microbiomists really look at the genome-wide sequencing aspect mm. of it because you then get that complete picture that you're talking about, the mm. real picture. So I don't think we really understand how to use this information yet. I absolutely agree, Kaz. I, I, I actually, I, I'm pretty sure we don't know how to use the information, <laughs> I know what I was saying. Uh, uh, I mean, I think it's really cognizant on us to be aware that there's a, all this impact that we're having and we really don't know what the flow through is. I, I mean, I didn't mention, but I find it absolutely fascinating this concept that if you're born vaginally as opposed to born by a caesarean section, you get a different microbiome from birth. And this is associated with some different health outcomes as you go through to the point that not recommended by medical professionals, but people are actually smearing feces on their babies at birth to uh, alter the microbiome to be more vaginal, if you like, in the thought that that will be associated with improved health. Yeah, we heard from their O'Reilly that um, in their Ops and Guiding Unit, parents are now asking for these things to be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's right. I mean, you think this is sort of, you know, way up. There, but this is happening at the women's hospital. Well, it's not under the guidance of clinicians, but it's uh, you know, occurring in a sort of ad hoc fashion. You know, We've often thought now with some of this research is about um, antibiotics and children and obesity, um, antibiotics and colorectal cancer, um, microbiome appears to impact on mutual aging. There's so many flow on effects that stewardship is no longer just going to be appropriate for treatment of infections. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a wide impact across the community and we need to be across the messages that we're giving. So do you think that there are any clear messages that need to be out there right now or I guess it's a four, the four swords message is quite 
Yeah, look, I think it's that, you know, you causing collateral damage, this is not stuff that is absolutely benign and has no long-term uh, effects. I mean, I think we've always thought of antibiotics as they can cause rashes and they can cause vomiting and you know, immediate side effects, but that longer-term consequences is not something that has sort of played into our decision-making. Tom, did they, did they look at, it looks like a study that would be set up for looking at whether they were selecting for multiple sites. It doesn't sound like they did, they just looked for the prevalence of individual genes in all of those isolates rather than looking at whether you ended up with yeah, multiple resistance. That, the pulse field gel electrophoresis was, was trying to tease that out and they didn't really have enough to, they had one resistant isolate but that was actually there in, in an initial, uh, there was some ESBL but that was in, actually in day zero sample as well as day 11 so the significance of that was, was hard to say. Yeah. That's interesting. In the list of things that are in the microarray, mm. it, it, it looks like they were, were addressing multiple resistance because they were looking for integrons. Mm. So into two and into one, so they were looking for gene clusters. There. And that just might have been that was the commercial array. Do you know whether they, that was their bespoke array or whether that was sort of the shelf? Uh, it was a bespoke array. And that's about as far as I could go with that. It's sort of a referred you to a supplementary index around the around the particular. Mm -hmm. Tim, they were doing sort of multiple time points. Did they look to see if given they were doing multiple time points, did they look to see whether people's or the organisms they culture turn change back to what they had prior to antibiotics, or did they when they had a change, did that stay? Only those initial ones looking at the E. coli coming back to levels and that the VLLA, uh, it changes and the leptotrichia and the, sorry, the other one that escaped my memory. But uh, yeah, so they, they did seem to overall come back to. But with the resistance patterns, did they, they yeah, resistance, did that stay in those organisms or did it? They didn't find an association between the presence of resistance genes and the time points going across. So you know, these resistance genes were essentially there you know, at the same frequencies at day zero as, as going through, so not necessarily driven by, you know, these particular courses of antibiotics. Thank you. Is there any more questions here? No. Okay, thanks, Tom. Right. Thank you.